here tonight to introduce our speaker is the chair of the lecture committee of the Orange County chapter of the Archaeological Institute of America, Caroline Maddock. Thank you. That is a mouthful, and she got it right. Thank you, Susan, and uh, thank you to the Beckman Center and the Distinctive Voices series for co-sponsoring this lecture with us tonight. Our Orange County Society of the AIA sponsors six lectures a year, and our lectures are free and open to the public. So if you enjoy archaeology, um, please join us. We have two more lectures uh, left this season. One is this Sunday, and it will be again uh, Sarah Paycheck. It's Parkek. She, it's spelled with a C, though. Um, and so she's going to be joining us this Sunday, just down the road at Concordia University at 2 p.m., and it will be an adjunct to this lecture that you're hearing tonight. Not identical, similar, but a somewhat different topic as seen from space. So we hope that uh, you will join us for that lecture. Following that, two weeks later on, I believe it's on April 14, our last lecture of the year will be on the latest research of the most recent Neanderthal findings and the youngest findings that we have found so far, closest to us, um, from a site in Gibraltar. So, April 10th, April 10th thank you. <laughs> yeah, a Sunday. I think it's another two weeks um, from this Sunday coming. So that will be our, our last one for this year. And I'm already working on the schedule for next year, so we'll keep you posted. And if you didn't get um, one of these, this kind of describes these lectures, and there's more on the table out there as you go out if you did not receive this uh, flyer. All of our lectures deal with current archaeological research throughout the world, and all of our lectures are held, except for this one um, that we share once a year with the Distinctive Voices series. Um, they're normally held just down the road at Concordia University, which is, uh, if you go past um, Strawberry Farms on University Drive, you'll hit the freeway and you've gone too far. It's, it's the stoplight right before Strawberry Farms, and you just come on in um, up there, and it's at Denault Auditorium on the Concordia campus. So we'll hope well, that we see a lot of you at our future lectures. They're all held on Sundays at 2 p.m. Dr. Sarah Parkak holds the endowed AIA Matson Family Lectureship. She holds also the AIA, I just did um, the Matson Lectureship. I just said that, didn't I? She is the Assistant Professor of Anthropology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham and the Founding Director of the Laboratory for Global Health Observation. She holds her degrees with Yale University BA and Cambridge University for her master's and PhD. And she is noted for being the first Egyptologist to use satellite imaging to identify new archaeological sites in Egypt. Her areas of special specialization are satellite archaeology, ancient Egypt, remote sensing, GIS, the ancient Near East landscape technology, archaeology, ecological issues, and survey methodology. She has received numerous awards and grants for her work and has conducted several mapping and survey projects in Egypt. And she is currently director of the Pyramid Fields Hinterland Survey in England. Egypt, that's where the pyramids are. I'm not reading my script too good. <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, she has several current publications out, including Protecting Cultural Remains from Space in Times of War, and another one uh, concerning the physical context of ancient Egypt. Her lecture tonight has been featured on the Discovery Channel, entitled Why Ancient Egypt Failed. So please welcome Distinctive Voices Series and the AIA, Dr. Sarah Parkett. Thank you all very much. I just have to get hooked up here.
being, being a professor, I, I tend to wander a little bit. So uh, I'm sure this is, this is on. Hello, can you hear me? Good, I'm on, OK. Well, before, before I begin, um, I just want to say a, a, a very large thank you um, to, uh, to the Archaeological Institute of America, to Carolyn, as well as to Susan for inviting me here to speak this evening. This is a tremendous honor for me. Um, I also want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. Um, I have to admit, uh, when I talked with the AIA last April, and when I talked to them about the different subjects uh, that I could potentially speak about, if you had told me then that Egypt would have a revolution <laughs> and that many sites in Egypt would be threatened, I, I would have said, uh, not, in a, not in a month of Sundays. Absolutely impossible. In fact, I was just there uh, at the end of November. And again, everything seemed fine. So um, that's, that's something I'll, I'll talk a little bit about today, sort of interwoven throughout my lecture. But um, I do want to focus on the subject matter that I promised I would, I would deliver to you. So if any of you have questions about what's going on in, in Egypt, I would be very, very happy to speak about that uh, during the question and answer period. Um, let me just get some water here before I, before I get going. Uh, before I really jump into my lecture, um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself and why I do what I do. Um, I'm originally from, from Bangor, Maine. Uh, we definitely do not have pyramids there. Uh, lots, of, lots of moose, lots of snow. So how does a girl from Bangor, Maine end up working in Egypt and end up using satellite imagery. Um, I can tell you that I have been dreaming of Egypt since I was a little girl. I can't tell you why. Um, this was in the age of just before cable. So when I was four, five, six years old, uh, and when I was asking my parents about pyramids, they thought, how, how is this possible? Why is she asking about pyramids? So um, I have to say my, my career uh, is due in no small part to the tooth fairy. Um, the, the, the reason I say this is because when I lost my first tooth, the tooth fairy brought me uh, a wonderful, concise history of ancient Egypt. Um, <laughs> and, and you know, I looked at it not too long ago uh, with, with a discerning professorial eye. And I have to admit, it was a pretty good history. So apparently my, my mom, otherwise known as the Tooth Fairy, um, she, she knew what she was doing. So I was very lucky. Um, our careers happen, some people say for a reason, some people say they're random and, and, and accidental. Um, let me just adjust this. There we go. That's a little better. Um, I have to say my decision to go into remote sensing um, was due to my grandfather. Uh, he passed away about 12 years ago, but he uh, was one of the founders, or rather one of the first users, of aerial photography for forestry. Um, he was a World War II uh, hero, and he really was, was my idol. Um, growing up, I would hear stories of how he used aerial photography to measure forest and forest density. Um, so when I was an undergraduate at Yale University, it was my senior year, I thought, wow, I wonder if we could use this technology to look at Egypt. Wouldn't that be cool? And at that point, he'd, he'd passed away a few years before. And I thought, what a neat thing. You know, I bet my grandfather would, um, would, really love to, would have really loved to talk about this. And when I started doing research, when I started looking into things, there had been almost no work done on the use of satellite imagery for Egypt. And that's really what got me started. Um, so I have been doing this now for, uh, for about 12 years. Um, I, I love it. I tell, them, I tell everyone I have the, the kindergarten job. You know, I look at pretty pictures on my computer screen all day, and then I get to scramble around in a, in a sandbox. So I, uh, I'm, I'm very blessed to be, doing, to be doing what I do. So the end of Egypt's Great Pyramid Age from space. Uh, in tonight's lecture, what I want to do is to show you that in archaeology, we simply can't take anything for granted. 
Um, we all know about Egypt's Great Pyramid Age. We all, we all think of Egypt. We all think of, of pyramids. And yet, for a period of time, this Pyramid Age ended, only to, to, be, to, to start again. But why did this Great Pyramid Age all of a sudden end? Because when you think about the term all of a sudden, that's really how it ended. So what I want to argue tonight is that, first of all, uh, we need science to answer questions in archaeology. I tell all my students, if they want jobs in archaeology, study chemistry, study physics, study geology, study satellite imagery. This is really where archaeology is, is going. Um, and I also think that one of the main reasons that, that the Old Kingdom ended was because of significant environmental change. It certainly wasn't the only reason but it's a major reason. And this is such a topical issue for us today. We're facing so many problems in our world due to an often unpredictable environment um, that's, that's changing our world far more quickly than, um, than, than we can say. So what I want to do first is give you a little bit of a background to satellite archaeology and then give you a little overview of the Old Kingdom and some of the work that I have been doing um, looking at how and why the Old Kingdom ended and how we can look at this from space. Uh, I then want to talk to you about what exactly happened. Why did the Old Kingdom end? Why, why should we care? I tell my students all the time, so what? What's, what how is this relevant to us today? Um, I then want to talk to you about both environment and environmental and textual evidence for this and leave you with some final thoughts. All right, so a little bit of a background to satellite archaeology. First of all, why do satellite archaeology? Um, I'm sure all of you use Google Earth. It's a tremendous tool. And, and that has changed the field of archaeology, I think, in, in an absolutely fundamental way. Now I have students in my classes who come up to me and say after class, well, you, you talked about the, the Great Wall of China in class, so I, I visited it last night in Google Earth. That's exactly what we want to happen. This is, this, is, this is a wonderful tool. So that really one of the first things that we use satellite archaeology for is to visualize the Earth, to give us a sense of what's there in a way that, that simply it, we couldn't do before with aerial photography, which is what you see on the upper image. This is the village of Deir el-Medida in Luxor, Egypt. The other thing that it does, it allows us to create amazing maps. In so many parts of the world today, you simply cannot get a hold of good quality maps, accurate maps. These are maps that we can use in the field to help us identify exactly where things are. And finally, it allows us, satellite archaeology allows us to start asking questions about the past in a way that we simply couldn't before. Is it possible to dim the lights? Oh, yes. Um, could, could we dim the lights? Is it possible? Dim the lights up front a little bit, see a little bit better? I don't know if there's, a, if there's a button. I'm always afraid to press a button. Oh, there we go. Hurrah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Apologize for that. Um, this is a map of an archaeological site in the East Delta of Egypt called Tel Tamai. It's a processed satellite image. And if you can see all the roads and all the outlines in this image, this is a plan of an entire Roman city seen from hundreds of miles in space. You know, this is, this is revolutionizing archaeology. For the first time, we're able to map things out completely. We know exactly where to go. We know exactly where to dig. This is saving time and saving resources. And as you know, in today's economy, um, this is something that we, that we have to strive for. So what is satellite archaeology? Ultimately, it's the use of what's called remote sensing. You'll hear me talk about remote sensing a lot tonight. Um, to identify archaeological or environmental features that allow us to have a better understanding of the past. This is the site of Abydos, and you can actually see very faintly the hint of mud brick right here. That's actually the outline of an unknown temple. You can see it from space. So that there's just countless things out there to discover. So how is it, and, and what, is it, how, how, what is satellite archaeology? How, how do satellites work? Well, there are many different satellites from, from all over the world. There are simply dozens and dozens of different kinds of satellites. They circle the globe, um, collecting information reflected off the surface. And satellites do two things. The first thing they do is they give a great uh, perspective. They allow us to, to have a real bird's eye view. Here you have, is, these are Iron Age forts in Germany 
The second thing that satellites do, and this is really where they, they become advantageous, they allow us to see in different parts of the light spectrum. So not just the visual, but the near, middle, and far infrared, thermal. And when we look at satellite imagery, we can combine this data together to see things like geological features and, and vegetation that's affected by what's buried underneath it. And these are the things that we can see using satellite imagery. So, so for example, there could be an, an entire city buried underneath modern fields. And using this technology and analyzing it, um, using different kinds of, of computer programs, we can actually get a sense of not only that there's an entire city there, but we can also begin to map it. So this is just to, to show you how satellites, how the data can be merged together, and we can use it to see things a little bit differently. So as I said, there are many different kinds of satellites. Uh, very high resolution satellites, such as QuickBird, you'll hear me talk about QuickBird tonight, it has a resolution of two feet. There are things called multispectral satellites, such as this Landsat image, um, which has a number of different parts uh, of, of information from the light spectrum. And there are things like this image down here, which is a strip of corona high resolution spy photography. Although it's really high resolution space photography, it captures a landscape that simply no longer exists. This image is from about 40 years ago. Now this is just incredible. This shows you how much satellite imagery has improved. There's a, an amazing new satellite out called Worldview 2. It has a resolution of a little over a foot. You see all these dots? This is on a beach in Haiti. Those are people. We now have the ability to zoom in from outer space and see people. So think of everything that we're able to see now that we simply weren't able to see before. You know, I, I can't tell you when we're going to be able to zoom in from space and see a pot shirt, but uh, <laughs> it's not too long from now based on how quickly things have improved. All right, and this, these are two very high resolution images. This is a quick bird satellite image, and this here <laughs> is Worldview 1, 0.5 meter of the great pyramid complex of Jordan. You could actually make out individual stones on the pyramid. You see all the people walking around here. So just, just extraordinary how, how much the imagery has improved. It's a very exciting time to be doing satellite archaeology. All right, so let me, let me give you a very quick overview of the Old Kingdom. Very important to discuss when we think about how and why it ended. Now, the Old Kingdom is really important because it ultimately serves as the foundation period for all of ancient Egyptian civilization. For thousands of years, the ancient Egyptians actually hearkened back to the Old Kingdom. They saw it as a real uh, high point in terms of, of architecture, in terms of art, in terms of innovation. You know, 2,000 years later, we see Old Kingdom artistic innovations imitated in tombs. So just to show you how, how long it was valued within ancient Egyptian civilization. So the Old Kingdom, uh, of course, we have many mortuary remains, pyramids, tombs surrounding the ancient ruins of the Old Kingdom capital city of Memphis, about an hour and a half drive south of modern day Cairo. We of course have the great development of not only pyramids, but Egyptian religion in association with the pyramids, the rebirth of the king ascending to the heavens or to the sky. Again, this is something that we see repeated again and again throughout Egyptian history. There are, of course, many pyramids, which you see here. There are dozens of different pyramids. I don't have time to, to, to go over them in detail, but just to show you the range and style of pyramids that were built throughout the Old Kingdom. Now, of course, we have how, the, the big question of how were they built. Um, and again, I don't, don't have a lot of time to get into that tonight, but I tell my students, you know, there's no one way to eat a Reese's Pieces peanut butter cup, and there's no single way to build a pyramid. All of them were built differently depending on, on the time period and, and materials. Of course, we have many different, uh, many different things associated with pyramids, the development of mortuary temples, mortuary complexes. Transportation of stone is another thing that the ancient Egyptians had to figure out at this period of time. It, it required massive amounts of labor and incredible state organization. That's ultimately what we have in the Old Kingdom, this, this great foundation of ancient Egyptian society, society through the state being organized. And we have stone traveling very long distances going down the Nile from the quarries at Aswan and Jebelain 
down to the memphite region. The delta, which I'm going to be talking a lot about tonight, was an incredibly important place in the Old Kingdom. Uh, first of all, it served as a great area of hunting and recreation for the kings. Also, and even more importantly, it was a place where there were many estates that were used for farming. And it was at these estates that the cows were raised that were used to help feed the workers who built the pyramids. So very, very important for the construction of, of um, pyramids as well as for feeding of workforces. We have amazing art from this time period, if any of you have ever been to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, a Museum of Fine Arts in, in Boston. You'll see some examples of this again. This was repeated throughout Egyptian history. We have the development of pyramid towns. So really, you get a real sense of, of foundation during this time. And the, the famous pyramid structure of ancient Egyptian society with the king, viziers, rulers on top, the bottom of the pyramid, peasant farmers. And the reason I wanted to show this to you is because if the farmers are taken out, where does the rest of the pyramid go? I want you to think about that and keep that in mind as we talk about the environment a little bit later on. The farmers, we, we always forget about the farmers because we never hear them. You know, you, you see sort of the invisible mark that they leave behind from all the work that, that Corvée labor did on, on the pyramids, but we, we, we don't necessarily let them have a voice. I think it's time that, we, time that we do. Of course, it's a great height of power for the king. Um, and we get a sense from tomb walls just how important farming is with the multiple growing season. The whole Egyptian world revolves around their farming schedule. When are they going to, to, to sow their wheat? When are they going to harvest their barley? Now, this becomes very important. The entire agricultural system and ultimately the entire economic system of Egypt revolves around the Nile when it floods every year. It floods into basins that are very carefully managed so that the, the maximum amount of flood water is retained and used to farm as much area as possible. Just to show you more images of farming. Um, also during this time, and this becomes important when we talk about the, the later collapse of the Old Kingdom, you know, when you have all these great rulers, and when you have all of these overseers and, and beautiful court ladies, well, court ladies like to wear beautiful jewelry. Where are they going to get it? Where are the kings going to get their finery? In addition to having significant forces of, of corvée labor to build the pyramids, the Egyptian organization, uh, state is organized to the point where they're able to send a number of expeditions abroad to obtain gold and myrrh and ivory and, and, and so much other finery from Punt and Nubia, uh, from, uh, from Lebanon, fine cedar wood. So the, it's not just the Egyptian economy we're thinking about, but of course the ancient global economy. Very end of the Old Kingdom, Pepi II is the last major ruler of the Old Kingdom. He rules for over 90 years. That's a very long time in ancient Egyptian terms. So what happens? Why does the Old Kingdom collapse? Does it collapse? That's another big question. So we'll, we'll, we're going to zoom, zoom out a little bit and talk about how we can start to see this from space. Uh, when I started my PhD, um, I was very interested in so the, the settlement and settlement patterns around the archaeological site of Tel Tabilla. Uh, convenient because my, uh, my then fiance was the excavation director at Tel Tabilla, right here. And we were interested in looking at the broader settlements surrounding this site, has remains from the Old Kingdom and also from later. So this is where I decided to focus my, my survey work for my PhD, in this area right here. Now, to talk to you a little bit about remote sensing. Um, here is a visual satellite image of a very well-known archaeological site called Mendes that I'll be talking a bit more about tonight. Now, when you're looking at an archaeological site from space, when you look at this, you think, okay, brown mound, fairly distinctive. And yet, when you start comparing that mound to the modern town next to it, things start getting harder to discern. The reason is that even in Egypt today, throughout the Delta and in the Nile Valley, the modern Egyptians are still using the same materials that they used to build thousands of years ago. That's mud brick. 
Of course, there's a lot of concrete as well, but it becomes really, really hard to differentiate between modern towns and ancient towns. The other issue is that, and this is, this is a point we rarely hear about, there's incredible continuity of occupation in Egypt. People are still living today in the same places they've been living for thousands of years. So how do you find these sites? How can we use science to try to attempt to find some of these sites that are otherwise hidden? So here, this is a visual. Well, really not visual. The fields are, are red because of, of this showing the infrared here. How do we start to manipulate the data to try to get a sense of, of where the ancient sites are? Well, first and foremost, you have to understand exactly what an archaeological site is. And these sites are called tells. Tell is the Arabic word for mound. And what it basically means are these layers and layers and layers of occupation, one on top of the other, to the point where you really do get a mound. And we have to think about what that mound is made out of. So lots of mud brick. Uh, skeletal material, silt, uh, potsherds. So how is it that we can look at the actual chemical composition of the archaeological sites in the dirt and start to think about how we can use that to understand what might be an ancient site? So that's ultimately what I did. I used a variety of remote sensing techniques. Some didn't work. You can see this site. You can't tell the difference between the, the, the archaeological site and the modern site, uh, site next to it. But using this particular technique to form a classification, that means you, you group together like pixels, pixels that have the same, what's known as a signature. And what this shows is that the organic debris within the satellite image actually retains the moisture more. So what I did, I was very lucky, um, in both my, my uh, Delta survey area and my upper Egypt, my middle Egypt survey area, I had a lot of data that I could test. There were about 100 known sites, so I could figure out what techniques worked. Here you see it's a visual image of a site. Using the classification, you can see all the red pixels, which are archaeological uh, bits of archaeological debris. And this shows you, actually, the different signature of the archaeological debris. It shows you it has a different value than the modern town, which is due to moisture content. So uh, following the, uh, the actual lab research in the summer 2003 and onwards, I did survey work in the eastern delta in this area. I surveyed about 60 different sites, some of which were, were very well known, some of which were not known at all, just to get a sense of how the science worked. And I was also fortunate, the Egyptian Exploration Society in London, um, they have a, a database of 700 known archaeological sites in the Delta. Um, so I was able to use that database to actually figure out what was going on and look at all the site data that was available so I could compare and contrast. Well, when you're out on the ground, how do you know it's a site? How do you determine what's there? First of all, the topography of Egypt is incredibly flat. You know you're probably dealing with an archaeological site or settlement or old river levee whenever you have this mound. So anytime I saw a mound that corresponded with my GPS, where these archaeological sites were located, and I found pottery, I call pottery the Tupperware of the ancient world. We, uh, we, we look at the pottery, we look at the form, we look at the shape, we look at, at the material and the manufacture, and that's really what allows us archaeologists to date archaeological sites. So you go and you collect pottery, you follow a rigorous survey methodology, and between those two things, you're able to start to get a sense of the dates of the sites. Now, when you're in the middle, when you're doing all of this work, of course, you, you can't make any definite conclusions. This work takes months, if not years. But, oh yeah, this just to show you, these are all the sites in the delta. And, and it's only a fraction of the sites that are there. We have just barely begun to scrape the surface in terms of, of finding all of Egypt's sites. So there's an amazing amount left to be done. We've really only just begun to do survey work there. All right, so again, the so what question. All right, we've got all this data, what do we do with it? Well, in archaeology, what we do is we put together all the available evidence to look at settlement patterns to try to determine what settlements existed during what periods of time and how and why they changed. Once we have that hard archaeological data, 
we can then use it together with known inscription evidence, previous excavation data, environmental studies, to really try to get a complete picture of what's going on. Now, if you notice, in this one particular part of Egypt, we've got 22 sites in Oral Egypt's earliest times, pre-dynastic, 27 in the Old Kingdom, and what's going on here? This period called the First Intermediate Period, which is the period immediately following the Old Kingdom. We only have four sites. What's happened? What's going on? So just kind of a rough map showing all the, all the sites. Now, I should note, this is a ca caveat, these are the sites that I found, not the sites that I missed. You know, I, I have a huge amount of work let, left ahead of me, as do, do we all um, when we're doing this kind of work. But there, So there are 27 sites that we know for sure exist in this area right now. And in the first intermediate period, it drops to only four sites. Now that's just, again, that's, that's me hypothesizing about the potential location of, of, of former river courses. I need to go out and do detailed coring and augering work um, to, to verify exactly where they were. Where are the other sites? What exactly happened? And to just give you a small sense of how variable the Nile River is, this is something we rarely think about. This is work done uh, by my, my friend Judith Bunbury and uh, Professor uh, David Jeffries of University College London. They've been doing this amazing coring regime throughout the apex of the delta and into the pyramid fields. And that shows you just how much the Nile shifted and changed over time. And that's going to have a significant impact on how and why and where people chose to live over time. This is really the, the first time in the last few years that the we Egyptologists have really started thinking about the environment and how it impacted the people of ancient Egypt and, and shows us just how many assumptions we've made that are actually wrong. So what happened? We've got these four sites that are left. Where are they? What are they? Why are they important? Well, when I started you know, looking at the data and started analyzing it, I said, wait a minute, these four sites, they're pretty important. In fact, they're the four largest sites in my survey. What does that mean? So the first one is Mendes. This massive site, which you can see here, you saw that that was the, one of the sites I used for my imagery processing, located in, as you saw, in the East Delta. It's a satellite image much closer image. What you can't really see are things called crop marks, so buried architecture. And even though the site is big, if you could imagine it being about that big, turns out a lot of sites in Egypt are significantly smaller due to, um, to, to inhabitation and encroachment. So these big cities would have been two, three, four, five times as big in antiquity. So we have this huge site, one of the only sites left in the first intermediate period. Um, we have, <coughs> excuse me, from this time, evidence of, a, is it a plague pit? Victims of a massacre? This dates to the first intermediate period. Are we seeing great or turmoil during this time? Uh, we're seeing lots of ash from excavations that were done. This is the, the work of my husband, Greg Mumford. Um, what's going on? Is there some sort of destruction? Is that indicating widespread turmoil? And this was done, uh, this dating was done using radiocarbon dating. So it's not, well, the pottery may be dating to the, the first intermediate period. It's definitely dating to this period of time. So we know at the site of Mendes, there is actual, in addition to there being evidence from the first intermediate period, we have evidence of internal strife going on. This is another site uh, called Tel Sharufa. It's another massive site in the delta. Some evidence of excavation work, again, absolutely massive. So we have two big cities. Then another city, uh, Tel Ibrahim Awad. The reason I wanted to show you this, you can kind of see a little bit of the exposed mound right here. And this is what I meant when I talked about so many of Egypt's modern towns being built on top of ancient cities. Because if we flip it around, you can see that it's not a tell so much as a small hill see the significant rise. And that shows you just how much of the town is underneath the modern city. So again, an absolutely massive town with evidence from the first intermediate period. Uh, there, there's another site as well. So we've got four sites with evidence of the first intermediate period, and they're the biggest towns in the East Delta. Why do we have them? 
So that's, that's kind of point number one. The other thing I wanted to mention to you quickly is evidence from ongoing archaeological work that we're doing along the west coast of Sinai. It's a fortress that dates to the end of Egypt's Pyramid Age, to this exact period of time. The Egyptians, up until the end of the Old Kingdom, would send these expeditions from Memphis across the eastern desert, crossing the Red Sea, to this site that we've called Tel Ras Budron, because they were interested in copper and turquoise. At the end of the Old Kingdom, these mining expeditions abruptly stopped. And we think at our site we have evidence of the end of Egypt's Pyramid Age. So the initial discovery was, was made by my husband about nine years ago. It's, a, it's this amazing site, fortress, circular, about 44 meters in diameter. And we have done some radiocarbon dating. Again, shows you that the fort floor dates to the end of Egypt's Pyramid Age. I have to say there's nothing like this anywhere else in Egypt. Uh, six meter thick walls preserved to two and a half meters on one side. And we've had about four seasons there so far. So it's just a reconstruction of what the fort would have looked like. Pretty, uh, pretty impressive and imposing structure. And you have to think, why would they even have this? They're, of course, afraid that they're going to be attacked by the Bedouin. So you've got to protect your, your copper and your turquoise expeditions. And uh, a lovely sort of brought to life construction showing you daily life in the fort. So why was this fort abandoned? Why was it left at the end of the Old Kingdom? Could it be that, that the government of Egypt could no longer support um, foreign expeditions? Was there strife? Um, what, what other reasons were there? Well, what we found at the fort in 2008, this wonderful bastion going off, probably an old anchorage point for, uh, for, for boats, we found this evidence of a sea, uh, some kind of sea surge some kind of tidal surge, which we have reconstructed here, showing the, the great irregularities in weather patterns during this time. So at this site, we have environmental evidence for environmental change. We have actual evidence for environmental change during this time. All right, so what happened? All right, we've got data in the East Delta from these four large cities. We have in a more remote part of Egypt evidence showing some environmental change during this time, what happened? How did Egypt's pyramid age end? Why did it collapse? Did it collapse? Is that a fair statement? Quickly run, run through this. Um, we see at the end of Egypt's old kingdom, the end didn't start at around 2200 BC. A lot of Egyptologists are beginning to think that Egypt's old kingdom started to collapse earlier. We have a lot more gifts, um, a lot more exemptions being made to temples showing economic problems. We see a lot more impoverishment at courts. And this is just a slide to show you how much Egypt's economy relied on the Nile. So we have the river, which of course supports farming, which supports mortuary cults, uh, which, which are connected to pyramids, which helps to feed priests and a lot of people. So the Nile River supports the economy of Egypt. And for, for anyone here that are, that are fans of, of uh, President Reagan's, this is really where trickle-down economics started. Sorry, bad, bad joke. Um, all right, so we see the, not only that the economy of Egypt really relies on the Nile, but also we see during this time actual textual evidence for attacks. We see uh, press labor gangs. We see, more importantly, a great decentralization. Egypt's main foundation, as you could see during this time, relied on the king. The king was the central focus of Egyptian civilization. He was a, a living god, and that started to change. We see in Egypt's provinces that the power is starting to move from the king to these rulers called nomarchs. They're acting almost as, as mini kings in different provinces throughout Egypt. So again, great decentralization going on. We see as well this, this great... Um, spreading out of the economy, spreading out of wealth. For the first time, these, these local rulers, these nomarchs, are allowed to have their own temples, their own tombs, uh, their own mortuary cults. They're allowed to build these things, and so a lot of the wealth is siphoned off that would have normally gone to the king. So we see a great change in the overall economic structure of Egypt. <coughs> The other thing that we start to see when ancient Egypt, when the Old Kingdom collapses, is a great decline in crafts. 
You know, it's something that um, I think shows a, quite a bit of impoverishment at the court. Um, it shows that the Egyptians simply don't have access to resources. We see these great expeditions that were going to put, that were going to Sinai, that were obtaining all of these great objects of finery. They stop. All of a sudden, the Egyptians have to rely on local resources. And if you don't have a lot of wealth at court, they can't afford to pay great artisans. And then you have a lot of, of nomarchs, a lot of local governors that are, are gaining in wealth and power, but they can't really afford to hire the Leonardo da Vinci's of, of the time, the, the, the great artists. So they hire more local help, and you do not have the quality. Um, so, so we see this as well. So we've got evidence from the, the archaeological record. We see environmental evidence from Egypt. And we know that within Egypt itself, we have significant social strife. We have, uh, we have evidence for decline in crafts. We see the wealth being dispersed. You know, this ruler, Pepe II, he rules for over 90 years. So there's a lot of internal strife that's going on. But what exactly caused the end of Egypt's pyramid age? Um, was it economic? Was it social? Well, I'd like to argue against both of those, those factors. Um, Economically, Egypt continued to function. It did not collapse as an entire society. It surely struggled, but people kept on. You know, the, the, the economy still functioned on a very local level. So certainly, the, the economy of Egypt, in its own ancient Egyptian terms, didn't fail. Was it social? Was there a revolution, like the revolution that we see today, still going on in Egypt? Um, well, again, we still have a lot of archaeological evidence from towns. You know, the social unrest, uh, it, 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 it certainly wasn't the sole factor. It certainly was a contributing factor. Was it political? Well, again, you have the power focused in the hands of these nomarchs, these local rulers, that are acting like kings on a local level. So it really wasn't any of these factors that solely contributed to the end of Egypt's pyramid age. I think they certainly contributed, but what I want to show you is that we have significant environmental evidence from both within Egypt and from around the world to show a major environmental event that occurred during this time. And if any of you are interested, I, I can, I'd be very happy to send you, there are dozens, hundreds of publications from top peer-reviewed journals uh, that, that discuss this, this um, environmental evidence. So it's not just a few publications. This is significant ongoing work. This is something that's accepted as, as fact within the scientific community. Something called the 4.2 uh, KABP event. So around 2200 BC, about 4,200 years ago, there was a major global climactic event um, that potentially uh, influenced the change in the circulation of Atlantic currents that affected weather patterns uh, throughout large parts of the world, uh, in particular weak monsoons, which seems to have contributed to collapse in Egypt, Mesopotamia, Turkey, Sierra Palestine, uh, and, and so on. So this is not something we're just seeing in Egypt. This is something that we're seeing um, in, in a large part of the ancient world. So this is, what I've just, this is some of the work I've done in, in, in Middle Egypt, not on this particular event, but just to show you some of, of what's, what it looks like. This is coring work that we're doing. Um, it just shows you some of the, uh, the collection techniques that we use. Everything is very uh, recorded in great detail. And this is something um, that scholars, uh, the, the famous scientist Jean-Philippe Stanley at the Smithsonian, uh, has done with, with others at both the uh, White Nile basins as well as in the Nile Delta. And what they've done with their coring is they have brought up evidence from the last two, three, four thousand years and beyond. And you can see at this particular point right here, um, it shows decreasing rainfall. The other thing that, that Dr. Stanley found are lenses of iron hydroxides in the delta. And they only uh, tend to appear in soil, in moist soil, during significant ongoing periods of, of drought. 
So there's, there's significant evidence for drought at this time. The Nile River, of course, flooded every year in July because of the monsoon rainfall that filled up its basins. The Nile flooded. The whole of ancient Egyptian society surrounded and revolved around this annual flooding. So if you can imagine yourself as an ancient Egyptian, and every year you pray to the gods, you make offerings. It's the king's job to make sure that the Nile floods. And then one year, the floods don't really come. But you think, OK, fine. I've got, enough, I've got enough grain stored up. I can make it through one more year. I've conserved. And then the next year, the floods don't come. And then the next year. And then you're in trouble. This, I think, is one of the principal things that caused ancient Egypt's pyramid age to fail. Not political, not social, not economic reasons, but the very fact that the, 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 the lifeblood, the life source of, of ancient Egypt, the Nile River, it did not flood or certainly flooded in, in uh, less, much less strongly than it did before. So where are we seeing this? Where else are we seeing this? Well, there's a lot of environmental evidence uh, that's taken from ice cores. I don't have time to get into that tonight. But what's interesting is there have been many studies done in and around the, the Mediterranean and Turkey and the Red Sea that shows, in addition to the coring work that's been done in Egypt. Uh, there's a lot of other scientific evidence that points to significant environmental shifts during this time. One of the studies that gets cited quite a bit um, is a study done in Lake Van in Turkey um, looking at varves. And what a varve is, these are layers of sediment that are deposited in, uh, at the bottom of lakes. And in years where the weather is good, you have thicker layers. And in years where the weather patterns are disrupted, you have thinner layers. And what scientists found, uh, the varve record from Lake Van indicated around 2200 BC a disruption in weather patterns. So that's, that's one area where it was noted. And in another study um, done just showing you that this is an event that just happened in Egypt. It happened all over the world. Uh, planktonic uh, oxygen isotope ratios, so studies on, on plankton and the isotopic ratios from this time from around 2200 BC showed a dis significant disruption in weather patterns. Plankton are very sensitive to abrupt shifts in climate. So that's one thing that archaeologists study to show how and when and why uh, the environment may have shifted. And it's very interesting, the Indus Valley civilization also collapsed around this time. In the Northern Red Sea as well, in the uh, Shaban Deep, which is right here, located a little bit to the east of Egypt. Again, looking at carbonate sediments. Again, scientists noted a significant environmental change around this time. I could go on all evening. I could cite dozens and dozens of other reports. This is just to show you that there is significant scientific evidence for climate change at this time. What we haven't had up until now is the settlement pattern evidence in Egypt to show exactly what happened, or what we think happened. All right, well, what about the textual evidence? We've seen archaeological evidence. We've seen scientific evidence. We've seen, we've seen environmental evidence. What about the actual texts from ancient Egypt? There are a number of these that, that I could cite, but these are really the most striking. I buried the dead, nourished the living, wherever I went in the drought that occurred. I closed off all their fields and mounds and town and countryside, not letting their water inundate for someone else, as does a worthy citizen, so that his family may swim. The steel of the, the butler, Mayor of Edfu. And that's interesting, because Mer Edfu is located in Upper Egypt. So it seems like this drought extended as far as, uh, as, as Edfu, to the south of Luxor. This is from the steel of the treasure Iti of Miotru. I nourished a Miotru in the years of misery. Though 400 men were in straits through it, I did not seize a man's daughter, nor did I seize his field. So what we're seeing in these two texts, these are, these are important men. And they're showing that they maintain their dignity, their decorum in this period of time. There are many other texts that are from the first intermediate period that show significant uh, uh, drought events. The most famous one, though, and it's a little controversial because we're not exactly sure of, of the date, but it's an interesting case study, is from uh, the noble Anktifi of Moala. Now, we see in Anktifi's tomb these gorgeous, gorgeous scenes 
of spearing, of, of fishing, of everyday life. But what's really famous from the tomb of Antifi is a, a um, series of inscriptions that talk about what happened during this great period of drought. It talks about people sailing up and sailing down the Nile in search of a measure of grain. It talks about uh, that, that, and again, I think this is, um, it, it's easy to read too much into things, uh, but it talks about how, how during this time the women were under such great distress that they, were, that, that they ate their children. Now, I don't think that that's, that actually happened. I think it's a metaphor. Yeah, I'm so hungry I could, I could eat a horse. I think that's been misinterpreted. But it just shows you how dire things were, that they're, they're using this beautiful metaphor in the language to show how much stress they're under. And what's, uh, what, what also is interesting is in 967 AD, in Cairo, we have almost the exact same thing happening. We have a lot more textual evidence for this. And reports from this great drought that lasted for a long period of time. Talk about how women were, were giving up their jewels to get a measure of grain, how they were going up and down the Nile in search of something to eat, and how they were so hungry that they were eating their children. So it just, it, you know, almost 3,000 years later, we see the exact same thing. So, so just to show you that drought is not something new in Egypt. What's going on more broadly? We've talked about the Indus Valley, early Bronze Age, um, early Bronze Age uh, Biblos. Uh, we see that there's great evidence for, for collapse. Uh, cities simply disappear during this time in Syria Palestine. So again, we're seeing this in Egypt, we're seeing this in Syria Palestine, we're seeing this in the Indus Valley, uh, we're seeing this in Mesopotamia. We have, of course, a lot of increasing attacks. Perhaps things are starting to change a little bit earlier. Um, we're seeing a rising Bedouin threat. So, so in these expeditions that the Egyptians are sending to get these really needed natural resources, they're simply not able to withstand the increasing pressure of the Bedouin, who are probably getting more bold. They realize that there are problems in Egypt. These are desert dwelling people. They're used to not having a lot of water. And all of a sudden, at 2200 BC, the fort is abandoned. Egypt no longer has access to copper and turquoise. So was this the last straw? Was this environmental change? Did it, did it end things? Were things going to end anyway? Well, we do have a lot of evidence throughout Egyptian history of, 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 of social turmoil, economic problems, political problems, but Egypt survives. We don't see as much change as what we saw at the end of Egypt's old kingdom. Potentially, um, we have a major reduction in the Nile height. And as I said before, this isn't something that happened once. You know, maybe one year of a low Nile isn't great, but Egypt can bounce back. What we're seeing are prolonged, significant drought events that last over a series of years. And that's when things start to get to be problematic. Because if you don't have water, all of a sudden, what do you do? What do you do about your crops? And this is where, this is where the settlement evidence that we found from space comes into play. Because it turns out that human beings, over thousands of years, uh, we, we don't change. Think about what happened during Hurricane Katrina. Everyone left New Orleans and went to the big cities. It's what we do. We pool our resources. We go to where we can make sure we can find food and water. So what I think happened during this time, during this great time of change, in this very marginal part of Egypt. You know, it, it was getting the last bits of the, um, of, the, of, of the flood. People are leaving and they are going to, um, they're going to the cities. So we have, of course, all the social strife, all of this political strife, great instability, increasing attacks, increasing aridity. So, so how do we put it all together? Well, a lot of, a lot of Egyptologists will argue that in Upper Egypt, we simply don't have the settlement evidence that shows significant change or collapse at the end of the first intermediate period. I would agree with them. We don't. Here's the reason why. It's basic logic. If you look at the Nile, if you imagine you've got the delta up here, kind of hooks around with, the, with Luxor and Aswan, the Nile River is really narrow in southern Egypt. 
before it gets into some of the wider basins and middle and, and certainly lower Egypt. And then once it hits the apex of the delta, it fans out into a series of branches. So even if you're going to have a marginal flood, your uppermost areas are going to get the most water. Your floodplain is narrow. You're going to be able to uh, siphon off a lot of water, which we have evidence for in, uh, from, from texts. People are going to thrive, like we see in Antifi of, of Moala. Uh, even though he is, you know, he talks about the drought that's going on, because he's a smart governor, because he's a smart nomarch, he's able to, to channel off water, he's able to, to serve as a, as, a, as a king, he's able to protect his people because he has more water. However, the more the Nile moves up, or rather goes downriver, when it gets to the, the delta and spreads out, if you have a, a very low powered flood and it, it hits the apex, the delta, and subdivides by a further seven, all of your marginal towns and villages that even in the best of times are not going to get as much flood water because it's going to be more spread out, all of a sudden they're in big trouble. So you see all these marginal villages and cities, they simply disappear during this time. So I think that's what's happened. I think that's why we're seeing the four largest cities having evidence from this particular period of time. And they were only they certainly um, able to have a much better understanding of them using space archaeology because we're able to look at the size, we're able to see for ourselves that they were actually bigger than we previously thought, and we're actually able to start to get a sense of how people moved during this period of time that we're only beginning to understand a bit better. It certainly took a long time for Egypt to recover. Uh, there's great internal strife, there are wars that go on. But well, the other thing that we also forget is that this great period of collapse led to an amazing rebirth. Without the first intermediate period, we wouldn't have the Middle Kingdom. Egypt's period of time that we know the best because of its flourishing literature, its art, its architecture, it really was Egypt's renaissance for a number of reasons. So even though the Great Pyramid Age ended, it kind of started up back again, albeit on a smaller scale in the Middle Kingdom. Um, environments, of course, were unpredictable. This leaves us with, uh, with a lot of food for thought. You know, the ancient Egyptians, they worshipped the Nile. They respected their environment. They understood, I think, better than we do today, uh, just how marginal their existence was. They made offerings to the gods. They had temples built. Because at the end of the day, they needed a good flood to survive. Without a good flood, their whole economy would collapse. The, it was the king's job to make sure that they had a good flood. And, and they understood this in, in a way that I think we have to respect. And as we all know, our own environment, things can change instantly. We have this, this terrible image from um, earlier, earlier last week at the end of last week, um, people's, our, our lives can change in a second, whether it's a tsunami or an earthquake or a hurricane or a mudslide. In our very modern world, with all of the most modern tools and equipment and, and pieces of technology, the people of, of Japan only had 30 seconds to get away from the tsunami. So I think that that puts, us, it put, puts things into perspective for us, because if you have a society that is based entirely on whether or not a river floods. I think we can start to, to really understand and appreciate what the ancient Egyptians went through. I think we can start to understand exactly why, for the first time, Egypt's pyramid age really did end. But the pyramids are a monument to the Egyptians' ingenuity, to their ability to, uh, to have great state organization. Um, and I think they're a testament to how well they understood their environment. That's something that we don't often think when we're standing in front of these great monuments of stone. So that I'll, I'll end uh, with a, a little bit of an advertisement. Um, I've been working with the uh, BBC for the last two years on a TV program called What Lies Beneath. It should air later on this year. So if you've enjoyed seeing some of what we can discover uh, using satellite archaeology, um, it's going to showcase not only what we can see from space, but how we can use it to start to reconstruct some of the hidden things that are out there. And finally, if, um, if you'd like to learn more about our project work, what we're doing, and what we're going to be doing in the next three years, please visit our project website at deltasina.com. Thank you so much for your attention.